75 years of standing for truth. With this one stop alone, we've been able to strike 20 names from their voter anomaly list. Ensuring underrepresented voices are heard. We have to have those conversations about race that most other white families do not have to have. Creating change. This bill is designed to deter jail employees and prison guards from using their control. Wouldn't have known about it without your coverage. And through it all, telling stories of hope. <laughs> of your communities coming together to support one another. We assume there's no way she could have made it. Tonight, King 5 looks back at the stories that had impact on Western Washington. And thank you for joining us for this special edition of King 5 News. I'm Greg Kofor. I'm Joyce Taylor. Tonight, we are taking a look back at some of the most impactful stories recognized with awards this year. First up, a King 5 investigation uncovers the biggest backlog in state history of mentally ill people sitting in jail waiting for legally mandated medical help. In a series that received a regional Emmy Award for investigative reporting, the King 5 investigators uncover the record-breaking wait times behind bars for people with serious mental illness. Here's Susanna Frame with her first installment of Mentally Ill Waiting in Jail. Sir, let me explain my expectations in the courtroom. I'm fired. Over the last several months, Your Honor, the suffering here is egregious. Our cameras were rolling. I have anxiety. As a record number of defendants deemed incompetent to stand trial filed into court. He has now been incarcerated four months. People with mental illnesses so severe, they don't understand the charges against them. It looks to me like maybe you're hearing voices today. Am I right about that? Uh -huh. Yeah. We are asking the court to dismiss this case. We saw defense attorneys routinely asking judges to throw out the charges. The defense is asking the court respectfully to dismiss the charges. Because their clients are sick and languishing in jail without mental health treatment for lengths of time never seen before in the state of Washington. Alexander J of Seattle is one of those defendants. The amount of time that Mr. J is being required to wait is barbaric. In April, a judge found he was incompetent to stand trial and ordered he be sent to Western State Hospital in Stillicum to try to get stabilized. The treatment's called competency restoration. The court ruled Jay needed to be out of jail and in the hospital within seven days. But he's been waiting behind bars for more than seven months. It's unbelievable. You want it to be done. Kim Hayes is one of Jay's alleged victims. A light rail security camera captured this random attack in March as she was going to work as a trauma nurse at Harborview. Her clavicle and ribs were broken and she thought she could have been killed. Can you characterize or put into words what this whole experience has done to you? Oh. Ooh. Um, it has changed my life. Kim says the state's delays are unacceptable for everyone. I want to move on with my life, but I would move on quicker if we, you know, for him, that resolution of getting him into an appropriate bed, an appropriate place. You think uh, you could heal faster? Yeah, oh, absolutely. In a 2015 order, federal judge Marsha Peckman ruled the state is violating the constitutional rights of some of its most vulnerable citizens, that jails are not hospitals, and the mentally ill are being warehoused while they wait for services. Peckman ordered DSHS to provide inpatient treatment within seven days of a judge ruling the help is needed. But that hasn't happened. Despite the judge's order and millions of extra dollars spent on resources, we found the state's wait times have gotten worse, not better. State records show in 2015, the average wait time for a bed at Western was less than a month. In 2022, that wait has shot up to four months and longer. Would you ever have imagined that in 2022 we'd be in this place? Absolutely not. ACLU's legal director, Laron Baker, was one of the attorneys on the case that led to the seven-day timeline. I didn't think there was a universe in which a state agency would just really renege on their obligations. It's a real human tragedy. A year after the federal court ruling, Judge Peckman railed against the state for not doing better, writing DSHS needed to stop the procrastination and false promises. She ruled the state in contempt and leveled fines for not meeting deadlines. From 2016 to 2018, that cost DSHS $88 million. 
After that, a settlement agreement put the fines on hold, but they're still accumulating. Records we've compiled show if it all has to be paid, the total bill would now be more than $300 million. I put together this database. Doctors Brian Weblinger and Thomas Kinlan are the state's top officials overseeing Western State Hospital. That's the total. What do you think of that? Uh, uh, unbelievable. Would you say that the state is in a crisis? A competency crisis, for sure. This has got to be difficult. Oh, it's uh, crushing. Uh, it's um, disheartening. The doctors say this year, the state was hit with a perfect storm, including the effects of COVID. After several shutdowns at hospital admissions, a backlog of cases are now coming through. Also, staffing is at historic lows. At Western State, about a quarter of the jobs are sitting unfilled. I'm being subjected to solitary confinement. And more than anything, they say there's a whopping increase in need. In the last year alone, Western saw demand for competency treatment skyrocket by 40 percent. We knew ahead of time that, that services um, would be increasing over time. We knew that. What happened recently, we, we don't understand that. I don't think anyone expected that to happen. DSHS is working to build new bed space. This project at Western State will add dozens of new spots next year. And they're building in Thurston and Clark counties, trying to decrease wait times for patients and decrease the likelihood of getting dragged back to court to pay the piled up fines. We have to be fiscally mindful and, and having to pay 300 million would be, you know, that's the taxpayer's dollars. So of course it's concerning. I am finding the department in contempt. Judges are clearly fed up, saying the state's efforts aren't enough for defendants, taxpayers, and victims alike. The delay posed by the government is unconscionable and it is inconsistent with the behavior of a civilized society. It is absolutely outrageous. They've got to pay the price for not providing this especially, you know, human care to people who need it, this mental health care. The longer this process goes on, it does take away your belief in the system and it affects so many people. In July, a federal judge found Washington state in contempt and ordered it to pay more than $100 million in fines. She said the Department of Social and Health Services has been violating the constitutional rights of mentally ill inmates since 2015. The money will most likely be spent on improving services for people with serious mental illness, including diversion programs, which are designed to keep people from entering the criminal justice system in the first place. One of King Five's core values is standing for truth. This next story exemplifies exactly that. Last November, Chris Ingalls vetted claims of voter registration anomalies in three Washington counties made by a group known as the Washington Voter Research Project. The group claimed it found hundreds of voters who were improperly registered, raising concerns about voter fraud. Now, this series received a Brooks Jackson Prize for fact checking for debunking a misinformation campaign that tried to undermine public trust in Washington's elections. Here's Chris Ingalls with the Fraud Crusade. Volunteers from the King County Voter Research Project zeroed in on the Trailer Inn's RV park in Bellevue after reviewing county election records showing that several voters are registered here. They flagged it as possible fraud by 20 voters who were voting from a business that rents RV spaces in this report submitted to King County Elections, which we received through a records request. We've got people that are overnighters and we've got people that have been here close to 20 years. A spokesperson says the trailer park is home for some people, but the Voter Research Project claimed they violated the requirement that voters register at their actual residential address. We couldn't afford a house when we sold ours back in Utah, so we've been living in this for almost two years. Dustin Reed, who works for the Department of Veterans Affairs, lives with his family of four in this 43-footer. does come to this address. His mail-in ballot to this address is one of the voter anomalies at the trailer park identified in the report. I don't know how they could, you know, say we're ineligible voters if they've never actually come out to actually see, right? I've, I've never met anybody out here to say, do you really live here? King County Elections Headquarters, we asked the director about voters registered at trailer parks. Is there anything wrong with that? Absolutely not. People can use a non-traditional address here in Washington State to get registered, provide us with a mailing address. In this list, there were voters that are military, overseas, 
unhoused or currently have a non-traditional address. So Dustin's voter registration. So for them to say it's we're ineligible is just kind of mind boggling. And the others here are all legal. With this one stop alone, we've been able to strike 20 names from their voter anomaly list. Voter Research Project says it found 444 registration anomalies in months of door to door canvassing in King County. My name is Chris Ingalls. I'm a reporter from King TV. How are you? So nobody came to the door asking about a guy named Schomburg. I'm just trying to verify what they've reported. In other areas, like the story we aired from Mason County last month, volunteers listed names, addresses, and specific information in their reports that allowed us to follow up by going door to door. We're just going to several different addresses that they put in their report. But King County Voter Research Project only identified a name and voter ID number. Other than the trailer park, we could not reliably locate other voters in their report. This is a big county, again, 1.4 million registered voters. Elections Director Julie Wise had her team analyze the Voter Research Project report in which almost all of the listed anomalies are voters who moved but are still registered at their old addresses. I didn't see anything on that list that um, that voters were doing anything that's illegal or inaccurate. She says the registration information that volunteers relied on was outdated. 90% of the voters had updated their address by the time um, that the canvassers went out to look at the addresses. Did you see anything that rises to the level of fraud in their report? I did not see anything in the report that rises to the level of fraud. How many volunteers out on the streets? So we've had roughly up to 50. This is the man behind the report. Boeing retiree Dave Griffin and his volunteers have been combing King County neighborhoods on behalf of the Voter Research Project. We're out looking and trying to help clean up the voter rolls in Washington state. He's undeterred by King County's finding that his canvassing team has uncovered few anomalies, if any. How would you characterize the security of our vote in King County? I think there is a lot of room for improvement. Have you found fraud out there? I don't know if the word fraud is relevant. What is relevant is there are a lot of questions. You say you don't like to use the word fraud, but you know that people, candidates maybe, will take your report and say, this is evidence that my election was stolen. The solution is to have clean voter rolls and the solution is to have clean elections. What's the one smoking gun? I mean, the one case that you can look at in your report and say, look at this, this is what we're talking about. Griffin pointed us to his report's claim that immigrants, visa holders, are registered to vote unknowingly through the state's motor voter program. Somehow our systems has allowed them to be signed up to vote. Give me those names and addresses and I will check them out. I'm not saying no, I'm saying let me check because I don't want to give out someone else's private information uh, that would put them in jeopardy. VRP has filed 28 challenges this year. Of nine hearings so far, five challenges have been sustained. Four cases have been denied. The county auditor says none of the cases involve anyone who actually cast an inappropriate ballot. I caught some in my driveway who just threatened to kill me and they blocked them in. He's here right now. A black newspaper carrier is confronted by police after Pierce County Sheriff Ed Troyer makes this call to a back channel of 911 in January of 2021. Troyer told dispatch a man was threatening to kill him before walking back his statements when officers arrived. That man was Cedric Altimer, and he tells a different story. He says Troyer was following him before the two faced off. That 911 call resulted in Troyer facing criminal charges for false reporting and making a false or misleading statement to a civil servant. A jury found him not guilty on both counts last December. I sat down with Altimer last May before that case went to trial, and he told me that he believes Troyer's actions violated his constitutional rights and could have cost him his life. I've been on this route for eight years. Since he was 18. I know everything about this place. Cedric Altimer has been driving these familiar Tacoma streets. This is a second home. This is a home away from the home. Six nights a week, he delivers some 450 papers in this predominantly white North Tacoma neighborhood. This is actually 
the dark road of where everything happened. Where he now takes a detour. This is Troyer's neighborhood, so you know, we don't get out the car no more. Not since January 27th, 2021. The night he says he had a life-changing confrontation with Pierce County Sheriff Ed Troyer. It's just not the same. It's just not the same. I just... Every time you drive in that neighborhood, you look at that one spot and you're just like, man, I almost lost my life. Alzheimer says it all started when he saw headlights in his rear view. A car appeared to be following him. He stopped, got out of his car, and confronted the driver. I asked him three questions, and I'll never forget those three questions. What were the three questions you asked him? Are you a cop? Are you, why are you following me? And is it because I'm black? And what were his answers to those three questions? He didn't answer if he was a cop. He told me his wife was black, and he said, I'm being a porch pirate. He said that to your face? Yes. Radio. Hey, it's Troyer. What can I do for you? Minutes later, Troyer called a back channel to 911. During the nearly five-minute call, he tells dispatch four times a man is threatening his life. He's in some sort of gray car, and he was in my driveway, in my neighbor's driveway, and he knows who I am, and he threatened to kill me. Okay, did he have a gun or anything? I have no idea. He looks homeless in his car, but he was in my driveway, and I got my car, and, and he was in my neighbor's driveway, tried to get my garage. And what kind of car is he in? Um, I don't know, some sort of beat-up, chuckled, homeless okay. looking beyond. Troyer's call initiated a massive response. The call to continue all outside agencies by county, UP, Puyallup, and Thunder, and Michael McCampbell. More than 40 law enforcement officers from 20 different agencies race to the scene, believing an officer is in trouble. Ultimately, 14 officers respond. Hey, keep your hands where we can see them. Hands on the steering wheel. Is that what you're coming over here for? Yeah, that's why we're coming over here, okay? I'm I'm suspicious, huh? No, because he called saying that... I don't care what he calls for. He's following me. Okay, we'll figure everything out. talk to him. I don't need you to figure out nothing. I am working. We will figure out. I am working. Okay. I'm a black male in a white neighborhood, and I'm working. That has nothing to do with that. Yeah, it does. He's following me. Okay. He's getting out of the way, okay? Okay. He's still following me. We will figure that out. Yeah, get the f*** away from me. I don't care how many cops show up. He's following me. What are you feeling in in those moments? Just a, you just feel your heart beating. It just starts pounding. Just a a adrenaline rush of fear. Like, you never know what's going to happen with these guys. Like, I had my hands in plain sight, and I still almost got shot. Is that how you were feeling? Like any second you might get shot? The way that they was yelling, yeah. I'm Sit working. On. Sit on the bunker. Alzheimer was ordered out of his car, frisked while police searched his vehicle. Troyer, not visible on a single body camera, was nearby. He made a lot of accusations that night. What part of that is true? Um, me going to and from a couple of different houses. That's true. Did I ever pull in his driveway? No. Did you have a garage door opener trying to get into his neighbor's garages? No. Never even heard of that. Did you ever threaten to kill the sheriff? No. Did you push against his car and block him in? No. When you hear him say all those things on on that call? It just upsets me. More than four minutes pass before a Tacoma police officer tells Alzheimer what's really going on. I'm going to be 100% honest with you. The reason there's so many cops here is because he's the, he's the sheriff. I see uh, a criminal act. Vonda Sargent is Alzheimer's attorney. That this man, the sheriff, he is the head of one of the largest organizations of police officers in our state, could call and say no less than three times that his life had been threatened is unfathomable. Police reports show that night at the scene, Troyer walked the statement back, saying Alzheimer never threatened him. Knowing that, Sargent says the incident should have immediately gone to the prosecutor with an eye toward charges. That did not happen. It's just racism. I mean, it, it's just a, it's a system of racism. Sargent calls it a clear case of economic and racial profiling and biased policing. I think he did do these things. I think the evidence supports that he did do these things. 
accountability to me would be him being convicted and for him to resign. He absolutely should not be the sheriff of Pierce County. Uh, he shouldn't be in law enforcement. Troyer, who has been with the Pierce County Sheriff's Department some 38 years, has denied any wrongdoing and accuses Attorney General Bob Ferguson of escalating and exaggerating the charges. In a written statement to KUOW, Troyer calls the AG's investigation a blatant and politically motivated anti-cop hit job. You see how dark it is out here? It's pitch black. No street lights, no nothing. Back in the neighborhood, Alzheimer has changed up his routine. Can't be in this neighborhood for too long. This is the most walking I do all night. Getting out of his car only when he has to. This is as far as we go before we hit Troyer's block. And then I turn around and come back. Alzheimer says the night Sheriff Troyer called 911 has changed his life. Now, he says he lives in fear and suffers from anxiety. He rarely leaves his home. I'm quiet. I can't sleep. I don't like to sleep. Because of the fact that I know that I could have been dead. And while he could change his route, he says he won't. I've just been over here for so long, it's just like I can't leave my people, you know? We just out here trying to get the job done at the end of the day. Make it back home safe and sound. It took seven hours for the jury to return a not guilty verdict after a nearly two week long trial last December. The criminal trial may be over, but Alzheimer's attorney has filed a $5 million civil lawsuit against Pierce County for emotional trauma and violating his civil rights. Well, not only did this next story win two regional Emmy Awards, it changed state law. The King Five investigators exposed how jail officials in the small town of Forks downplayed accusations a predator was working in their midst. The offender was not an inmate, but rather a jail officer. 23-year-old Kimberly Bender took her own life after reporting sexual harassment by her Forks jail guard, Officer John Gray. As King 5's Taylor Murfandoreski tells us, his behavior went unchecked for months. At a memorial this month on the Quileute Indian Reservation, 23-year-old Kimberly Bender's friends and family didn't just celebrate her life, they demanded justice from the city of Forks. They failed her miserably. About three weeks before the Quilu tribal member died by suicide in her Forks jail cell, she reported sexual harassment by her Forks jail guard, Officer John Gray. Yeah, I know this is kind of uncomfortable for you to talk about. I, I can tell just by looking at you that you know, this is really bothering you. Last year, Gray went to prison for sex crimes involving four other female inmates he was supposed to be looking after. But Kimberly never lived to see a criminal case. Before her death, the Forks police chief found her accusations unsubstantiated. He said the city couldn't find evidence to prove Gray did anything wrong. I felt her fear. I felt her anger. I felt her disappointment. The city of Forks agreed to pay Kimberly's family $1 million, a settlement that will benefit her six-year-old son. One year after Kimberly's suicide, Gray pleaded guilty to sex crimes involving four other female inmates. He served 13 months of his 20-month sentence. King 5's investigation prompted state lawmakers to create a bill imposing harsher penalties for sexually abusive jail and prison guards. Governor Inslee signed it into law this past March. We want to take some time to recognize a few other stories honored with awards this year. King 5's photojournalist team took home second place for Station of the Year at the National Press Photographers Association Best of Photojournalism competition. Some of our photojournalists even took home individual awards. Mike Perry won first place for Breaking News. Joseph Huerta, third place for Deadline News. And Jordan Treese received an honorable mention in the video editing category. King 5 sports reporter Jake Garcia and photojournalist Joseph Huerta received a regional Emmy Award for their work on May Finds Her Voice. That story followed a Bellingham team working to inspire women and kids of color to play hockey. 
And King 5 took home a regional Edward R. Murrow Award for excellence in diversity, equity, and inclusion for P.J. Randawa's work telling indigenous stories in the Pacific Northwest, one of the most prestigious awards in the world of broadcasting news. The Murrow Awards recognize stories that uphold ethical standards and demonstrate the impact of journalism as a service to the community. At King 5, we strive to give underrepresented communities in Western Washington a voice. This next story received a regional Emmy Award for diversity, equity, and inclusion. After our Facing Race team found the color of your skin can impact the value of your home. Facing Race reporter PJ Rendawa shows us how a simple home appraisal exposed decades of systemic racism for one Seattle family. Lights, camera, action. <laughs> We have like one of those like paper things that's like that goes. Fuck. I do actually. <laughs> Quiet on the set. Action. Action. When is breakfast getting ready? <laughs> That's about it. <laughs> in the Clark home, kitchen conversations sizzle in life lessons. <laughs> Handed down from father to son. Generational wealth is property or money that you pass down for genera um, generations to come. Even at just 10 years old, Jackson knows. Okay. Dreams are free, but wealth takes work. <laughs> the first step, Woo! setting down roots. It's been four years since the Clarks bought this Columbia City home. The homes are selling for over a million dollars. I'll go rinse this off. Okay. But while the Clarks were renovating... Put in a new kitchen. A home appraiser sent by their mortgage company told them the value of their home had gone down. My agent asked me, how was the appraisal? I was like, oh, it came in really low. He's like, oh, what was it, 800, 900,000? And I'm like, no, no, it was in the sixes. $670,000 to be exact. It was quite amazing to have appraisal that low in this neighborhood. Earlier this year, Seattle real estate prices hit record highs. So Joe's appraisal seemed questionably low. According to Zillow data, the typical home value in Joe's neighborhood this spring was over $900,000. I just want to make sure that we get the fair market value for the home. So Joe staged an experiment. He scheduled a second appraisal and asked his white neighbor, Marta Ewell, to be his stand-in. The objective was to see if you had a person that was not someone of color in the house change the amount that he got for the appraisal to see if there was some kind of bias there. Here we have the African art. I took these down as well. Joe began the process of what he calls whitewashing his home. This one here is a picture of my grandparents. It's a picture of my daughter at Christmas time. I took him down for the second appraisal. And this time when the new appraiser came weeks later, they saw Marta's white face instead of Joe's. The second appraisal came back over $300,000 higher than the first one. We got the lower price and the neighbor got a higher price than what the house is worth. Wait, what? Yeah. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? That's a bad thing for us. Yeah. But I was mad that, that we had to go through that in order to get him an appraisal that was in line with what the rest of the neighborhood has. Because it is part of our systematic racism that we have here in America. We took a closer look into the differences between the two appraisals to find out how they could be so far apart. It's taken away our generational wealth. We know appraisals are largely based on what similar homes in the area have sold for, but... There's no set standard of what that is. Where they draw those lines differ. And that can be a problem. Dr. Junia Howell is an urban sociologist and race scholar who studies home appraisal disparities across the country. Am I surprised by this case? I've seen a lot of them. They're not an anomaly. Take a look at Joe's first low appraisal from April. To assess the value, the appraiser chose comparable or similar homes that had sold up to two miles away for around $600,000 over the previous six months. Now look at Joe's second appraisal. It took into account some homes nearby sold for more than a million dollars, including the home right next door to Joe's. Using that critical context to compare, the second appraisal was $300,000 higher. Homes in communities of color are worth 70% less on average when holding everything else constant as homes in white neighborhoods. It's really insane. That disparity adds up. A recent study by the Brookings Institute found the appraisal differences amounted to roughly $48,000 per home or $156 billion cumulatively in majority black neighborhoods. Because our 
black and brown families' homes are often devalued. They're often taken away from us. Joe and his family are navigating a system that is deeply rooted in documented racist rhetoric. Appraisal manuals from the 1930s all the way to the 70s had perpetuated the belief that race was linked to value. Look at this manual from 1946. They ranked, in their words, Negroes and Mexicans at the bottom of this list of who brings value to a neighborhood. At the top, white Europeans. That's racist and historically deeply problematic and contemporarily affecting real people's lives in ways that we can collectively push against and say we want and we demand better. Such discrimination became illegal under the Fair Housing Act of 1968. But while the manuals may have changed, the diversity of the people determining home values hasn't. According to the U.S. Department of Labor, 96.5% of appraisers are still white. We have to have those conversations about race that most other white families do not have to have. He wants me to um, be successful in life. We're fighting for the next generation. For Joe, that means not worrying if the color of his skin will impact the value of what he can pass down to his kids. So I wouldn't have to struggle or minimize those struggles as a black man in America. Nice. Well, now to a story that captured attention and support from around the world. The push to bring Tokate, the last surviving orchid captured from Puget Sound, home. Sadly, Tokate did not get the happy ending that many had hoped for. She passed away earlier this year in Miami, just as plans were falling into place to bring her back to the Salish Sea. King Five has been following Tokate's journey since 1970, when she was violently taken from her pod near Whidbey Island's Penn Cove. Researchers say that she was about four years old at the time of her capture. She was then sold to the Miami Sea Aquarium for $20,000 and spent more than half a century in captivity in one of the smallest orca tanks in the world, forced to perform multiple times a day in poor conditions. To the Lummi Nation, orcas are considered family, relatives under the waves, they're called. For decades, they spearheaded the fight to bring Tokate home. Facing races, PJ Randawa shared their push to return the stolen orca to Puget Sound. Welcome. We're the Lactamish people. On the shore of the Salish Sea. These are the native waters of Quithalmachan, orcas. Members of the Lummi Nation and others pray for the return of someone they consider family. A southern resident orca that was captured from these waters more than 50 years ago. This is her home, not in Miami, the cement tank. That's not where she belongs. We ache for our relative. So it was important today to gather to send prayers to Skelly Chaktanut to let her know we're coming for her. The Lactamish people call her Scully Chuktanut, but here in Miami, where she's been held in captivity for the last 50 years, she's Lolita. She's legal property of the Miami Aquarium. When you are close to her, you can feel the sadness that she's just hanging on. It has just taken a lot longer than we had ever hoped. Scully Chuktanut's story begins in 1970, around the time King Five began investigating orca captures in Puget Sound. He had aircraft flying over the San Juans to spot them, boats with explosives to separate the adults from the babies. It was during one of these captures, Scully Chuktanut was violently taken from her family in Washington's Penn Cove. She was just four years old. They only wanted the babies. She is the longest living orca in captivity. When she was brought to a pen on the dock by the harbor, she was crying. Her mother was crying. People around Penn Cove, the older people can still hear the cries, the screams. The whole capture itself, how traumatizing would that have been? Terribly traumatic. Pain on the side of their heads when those bombs are going off. 
Howard Garrett, co-founder of the Orca Network, showed us photos from some of those whale captures in the early 70s. The older females would gather around the young ones and try to protect them. They knew what was happening. Since her capture, Scully Chuckdenut has lived mostly alone here at the Miami Aquarium. It's shallow. There's nowhere in her tank that's deep enough that she can dive. Ellie Kinley and Raynell Morris are Lummi tribe members who have visited Scully Chuckdenut in Miami. You know you're not alone. You'll see that there's two umbrellas for the trainers that are working with her, but yet there's no shade for her. According to a 2021 inspection report, she's fed poor quality rotten food. The water in her tank is dirty and her trainers disregarded veterinary instructions to make her perform despite injuries. This is an extreme case of torture and abuse. She's been treated very, very badly by a lot of the staff. In March, the Dolphin Company purchased the Miami Aquarium. As a condition of the sale, the company had to retire Scully Chaktanut. For now, she remains in Miami. The company did not return our request for comment. She has now gone from the corporate books from an asset to a liability. So that's a huge incentive for them to come to the table and want to partner with us. Scully Chuckdenut's advocates are working to get an independent veterinarian to assess her condition and determine whether she could safely make the 3,000 mile journey back home. It's been done since the 1960s, hundreds of times orcas have been transported by plane. First, Scully Chuckdenut would be coaxed into a custom made stretcher and lifted out of her Miami aquarium with a crane. The 20 foot, 7,000 pound orca would then be lowered into a small container, not much bigger than herself filled with ice water to prevent overheating. From there, she'll be loaded onto a cargo plane for a six-hour trip to the Bellingham Airport. Next, onto a barge, which will transport her to her ancestral waters in the Salish Sea. Her new home will look very different than the cement aquarium she's spent the last half century in. The plan, created in collaboration with wildlife researchers and marine mammal veterinarians, calls for a netted underwater pen, 250 feet long, 100 feet wide, and 30 feet deep in fresh ocean ocean water. The scent of the cedar brings the salmon home. And that scent travels across the water to her. She's home. It's calling her home, like it calls the salmon home. Here at home and in Miami, a special call from her family. And when we went to Miami in 2020, we brought our cedar with us to put it in to the water outside of her tank. So Skelly Chuckdenut would smell that cedar. Skelly Chuckdenut! And know that's home. Skelly Chuckdenut! She's 56. She has 37 plus beautiful years left of her life. When she comes home, she'll feel comforted. Her struggle's over. I can see it. On the horizon, advocates hope for a reunion, a half century in the making. In March, an agreement was reached to send Tokate back to Washington, where she would have spent the rest of her life in the 7,000 square mile Salish Sea Whale Sanctuary. But she never got the chance to see freedom. Tokate died on August 18th at the Sequarium, where she spent, as you heard, more than 50 years in a tank. A necropsy report released in October revealed she had chronic kidney disease and pneumonia, which led to her death. Some of the problems were likely a result of her age. She was about 57 years old. Her ashes were scattered in a private ceremony on September 23rd by members of the Lummi Nation. A story of hope in the face of tragedy. On January 7th of last year, James and Dee Dee Fritz were inside their home with their three-year-old twin labs, Sammy and Lily, when a landslide caused the first floor of their home to collapse. Dee Dee was able to crawl to safety. James, trapped in the debris, was rescued by firefighters. Sadly, Lily was killed in that collapse, and the couple thought Sammy died too. But almost a week later, a glimmer of hope. Neighbors heard a whimper coming from the home and fire crews got to work risking their own lives to bring Sammy to safety. King Fazer Kazuko brings us this heartwarming story of survival. Six 
days after a landslide caused the first floor of this home in Seattle's Magnolia neighborhood to collapse. Firefighters are working and family and friends are waiting. We got a little cry this morning. After the sound of a whimper this morning, neighbors called the Seattle Fire Department. Because of the landslide that happened last week, it is not safe to enter the home. And so right now we're exercising extreme caution for our own crews. They cut through walls and tossed out debris. And hours in. You got her? You get her? Yeah. They discovered Sammy safe. Yeah, nice and calm. So she stays calm. Okay. okay. Here we go, rock. Mommy's here. Just say, yeah, Mommy's here. Out your mouth. Yeah. Remy's got it. Remy's got it. Family friend Remy Olivier carried the black lab down a ladder to her owner. And finally, in that moment of reunion, a hopeful embrace after all this loss. I, I did not expect this to go so well. Sammy was released from uh, from veterinary care the day after she was rescued and made a full recovery. Crews were also able to recover Lily so the family could say a proper goodbye. Dee Dee and James told King 5 they are thankful to the firefighters, the veterinarians, and so many in the community who offered their support. Chase, I gotta tell you what, big student section, but yeah. too quiet, are they ready yeah. to go tonight? <laughs> they have been here for hours. The Gig Harbor Tides are ready to roll tonight. Oh, it's easy on your knees, Joyce. You never get hurt. I mean, I can take some over to you over there. I saw I almost hit Mark. I mean, it's such a fun sport. You burn a lot of calories. And like I said, I'm going to play this sport until I'm 100 years old. We're going to try to get Rich perfectly Ready? placed into the weather center. I'm going to have to release before I get to your anchor right, we got chair. This. We got Are we this. ready to go? Rich, you feel safe? Rich, you good? good? I don't right. feel safe. Five That's fine. coming up. Here we go. Ready to get him into the weather center. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. All the mornings, <laughs> memories. Chris Egan, many know him as the Prince of Puyallup, a pickleball fanatic and a high school football aficionado. For almost two decades, he's been bringing you highlights, heartwarming stories from the sidelines, and plenty of laughs along the way. This year, his hard work was recognized. He was awarded a regional Emmy for sports anchoring. And what better way to show off his love for sports in the Northwest than by playing the one he loves best. Here he is facing off against one of the top pickleball players in the world. Wow, you're pretty good, man. Who are you? My name is Riley Newman from Whidbey Island, Washington. I'm 29, and I play professional pickleball. And you play pro pickleball? Currently ranked number one in mixed doubles, number two in men's doubles. And you're a sponsored player? Got my own signature paddle. It's the 206 signature paddle. Hey, so I heard there's such thing as pros. Is that true? There's a pro tour. It's the PPA tour. It's what I play on. I play at 20 tournaments. Isn't this sport for old people? That's the beauty of this game. Everybody can play it. Fastest growing sport in America because of these rallies. Whoa. Who is that? You guys are on my court. Who are you? You don't know who I am? Today in Above the Fold, we're going to feature one of the top pickleball and tennis players in the country, Chris Egan right here. Not just an on-the-corner tennis and pickleball player, dominated the 80s, and now it's 1993. And some people are saying he could be the greatest racket sport player of all time. I'm not sure anyone will ever beat Puyallup's Chris Egan in tennis or pickleball. Oh, great memories. I'll show you who I am, you little whippersnapper. I got this, rookie. Go get a shave. You ready to go one-on-one? -on -one? Born ready. Oh, you're ready to go down. Let me WD up my paddle a little bit. Take this jacket off. Oh, you ever seen that many medals in your life before? My last tournament. No, not these medals. These are pure gold right here. 1984, 85, 86, 87, 88. The champion. Let's do it. I got paddles older than this guy. Nice headband, Pat Benatar. Pat Benatar? It's kind of a compliment. 
Oh no! Don't come at me! Is that all you got? This guy thinks he's so good. I'm not even breaking a sweat out here. He's so good. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Uh. <gasps> this is where I shine. Oh. Ah. You want a pickle? I'm having flashbacks to 84 championship. 1984 champ? This guy, this guy can't do it. I was there when they founded this sport. Oh, oh! I've never seen reactions like that before, have you? Like a cat. Just hit my nipple. Oh yeah, you hang it, I'm gonna bang it. Time for you to go back to the senior retirement home. And oh, gosh! You got lucky. But rookie, you're pretty good. Good Cong game, old man. Yeah, congrats to you. Keep pumping up pickleball. I do want a rematch, though. When? Maybe 1990. I was born in 1993. Exactly. <laughs> Had a lot of fun with that one, that's for sure. <laughs> Another thing that sets Chris Egan apart, his work ethic. He was hard at work during the awards ceremony. He found out that he won during a commercial break on King 5. Our news director accepted the award on his behalf. Take a look. Chris! Chris, it's you! Chris! Chris, it's you! Chris, make a speech! Chris, make a speech! 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 Wow, I am humbled right now. This is pretty cool. Always humble. Add it to it's the so rest delightful. of those he has. And so deserving. Congrats. Well, finally tonight, we wanted to recognize you. Last year, during our home team harvest food drive, you helped King 5 raise 21.5 million meals for communities all across Western Washington. King 5 took home a regional Emmy Award for community outreach for this campaign, but it would not have been possible without the generosity of viewers like you donating your hard-earned money to people in need. Here's a look back at what you helped us accomplish in 2022. The demand is pretty frightening for, for me and it was making me feel like a failure as a mother to not be able to feed my baby. There's more people who are food insecure this year. Every student is affected by this. Food insecurity looks different for everyone. We can do something about this that's a little bit more dignified. Good morning, I'm Greg Coppola alongside Joyce Taylor. We're down at Lewin Field today for the Home Team Harvest event. We want to provide food to everybody. A one in 12 households here in Washington dealing with hunger right now. And you all can help join our King 5 family today. Some donations already coming in. When we got here this morning, it was iffy. Now it's full again. There are volunteers here hard at work stacking shelves there. Northwest Harvest inventory is down 80% from last year. That's why Home Team Harvest is so important. Any donation you make right now goes to helping people, family, kids, the elderly, all year round. And we can see here that the need is really great. This is just the beginning of what we hope is going to be a spectacular day. Thank you for your generosity. We did it! Thanks to you. Because of you and your support, we reached our goal. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you. Home Team Harvest was a huge success. An estimated one in 12 families in Washington are facing food insecurity. That's why our goal is to raise 23 million meals this holiday season. Scan the QR code on your screen. Join us for our 23rd annual Home Team Harvest and be part of this incredible journey. Every meal donated brings us one step closer to a hunger-free Washington. That is all for this special edition of King 5 News. Thanks for watching.